Hello, I am Joshua P. Warren, and this is Joshua P. Warren Daily. And you know, my good buddy David Weatherly is one of my favorite writers. This guy has traveled the world, and if it's weird, he has written about it. I promise you. Ghosts, aliens, black guy kids, some things that defy easy categorization. But he especially likes to write about monsters. And I'm very lucky because David lives here in Las Vegas now. And so we get together a lot and get into mischief. He has been on television with me. He has spoken at the Creepy Vegas Ghost and UFO Show. We have a lot of interesting projects in the works right now. And he has this new book out. And this is a really good one. They're all good, but this is, man, this one is, it takes the cake. It's called Monsters of the Last Frontier, Cryptids and Legends of Alaska. And I bet, I'm sure you've seen a Bigfoot. I'm, I'm sure you know what a werewolf looks like. I'm sure you know what a dogman looks like. But I'd be surprised if you've ever seen an otter man. Yes, an otter man. You know, usually otters, we think of them as little cute things with a big long tail. They swim around in rivers and streams. Imagine if an otter were about six to eight feet tall, standing upright, and it had a nasty scowl on its face and that big long tail whipping around. That's what's on the cover of this book. And I'm going to tell you all about who Otter Man is here in a minute. You have Otter Man standing there at the edge of a lake with these majestic mountains behind him. A couple of uh, looks like eagles swooping around. And one of the great things about David's books is that he always has his covers done by Sam Sheeran. And Sam Sheeran is hands down the best book cover artist out there and so and and sam loves doing weird paranormal stuff i even uh, hired him to do the cover of my novel the gringo maniac murder spree and so he does all of david's covers uh, these days and really is able to bring some of these just crazy looking creatures these mystical looking beings to life and so that's what's on the cover of this book. If you would like to see it for yourself, you can just go to Amazon.com and look up uh, Monsters of the Last Frontier by David Weatherly and take a look at the cover. But anyway, before I read you some passages from this book, I want to point out to you that, you know, I've never been to Alaska. And one of the odd things about the fact that very few people have been to Alaska is that Alaska is absolutely gigantic. If you go online and you just do a search for this term, Alaska overlaid on lower 48. So in other words, it's Alaska overlaid on top of the, the, the 48 states that you're all, you're mainly familiar with here, basically everything other than Hawaii you are going to see what a huge chunk of land Alaska is compared to this giant country that we live in. And to make that even clearer for you, California, most people have probably been to California or at least you're more familiar with it. California is huge and it takes up 4% of the United States. Texas is even bigger and it takes up 7% of the United States. But after Texas, the next biggest one is Alaska, and it takes up 17% of the US. <laughs> so yeah, so you have Alaska taking up 17%, Texas at seven, California at four. It's gigantic, it's 663,268 square miles. The whole country is about 3.8 million square miles. So, yeah, it's big, 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 and still largely unexplored. And it's funny to have 
such a giant state that so few people have been to and people who have been there have only been to a small part of it because it's just so big you can't explore the whole thing easily and the landscape is so diverse and so potentially treacherous so keep that in mind as i read you some passages from David's new book and I'm going to start with his introduction because he does a good job of emphasizing some of these basic facts about Alaska and why that it's such a special mysterious land that he calls the last frontier actually that's why it's that's what it's been nicknamed um, so again this is uh, the introduction from David Weatherly's book Monsters of the Last Frontier Cryptids and Legends of Alaska. Forward, by the way, is by Ken Gerhard. But here is the introduction by David Weatherly. Nicknamed the Last Frontier, the state of Alaska is in the northwest extremity of the North American West Coast, just across the Bering Strait from Asia. By area, Alaska is the largest state in the Union coming in at 663,268 square miles, which is uh, also in kilometers, 256,089 kilometers squared, uh, much of it raw and rugged territory. While it may rank first in size, the state ranks 48th in population. U.S. statistics for 2018 revealed a total population of 737, 438 people. Considering its size, Alaska rates as the most sparsely populated of the 50 states. As expected, the bulk of the population is clustered around cities, leaving vast tracts of unpopulated land. 17 of the 20 highest points in the U.S. are in the state, with the highest being Denali, formerly known as Mount McKinley, rising a staggering 20,310 feet, that's 6,190 meters, into the sky. For perspective, consider Pikes Peak down in the lower 48, and that's how Alaskans refer to the rest of the nation. Pikes Peak is at 14,115 feet. And if you're viewing it from Colorado Springs at 600, excuse me, at 6,035 feet, you're looking at roughly 8,000 feet of impressive rock. If you're looking at Denali, from the Yenta River Bank at 240 feet above sea level, then you're basically seeing almost three Pikes Peaks stacked atop one another. It's a truly impressive vista and almost otherworldly. The lowest point in the state is at sea level. Alaska has a longer coastline than all other U.S. states combined and it shares a maritime border with Russia and land borders with the Canadian province of British Columbia and the Yukon Territory. The state is resource abundant with an economy dominated by fishing, mining, and the oil and gas industry. At its peak, Alaska's North Slope produced more oil in one day than Texas did in a week. But production has tapered off, with Alaska now being the nation's second largest producer of petroleum. The capital is Juneau, but approximately half of the state's residents live within the Anchorage metro area, the state's largest city. Prior to U.S. statehood, Alaska was a territory controlled by the Russians. In the 1860s, the United States and the Russian Empire entered treaty negotiations involving the territory. The process was overseen by then Secretary of State William Seward and Edward de Stoke, Russian minister to the U.S. By the time things were settled in 1867, the United States had purchased Alaska for a total cost of $7.2 million. The price equated to about two cents per acre and became known as Seward's Folly or Seward's Icebox. 
the deal was considered foolish until the Klondike gold strike opened the door for the Alaskan gold rush. Between 1896 and 1899, an estimated 100,000 prospectors made their way to the Klondike region seeking their fortunes. Fueled by the discovery of gold in the late 1800s, towns and cities grew as people rushed to the territory hoping to strike it rich. Rugged conditions didn't deter those with dreams of gold in their minds. Alaska was organized as a U.S. territory on May 11th of 1912. It was finally admitted to the Union on January 3rd of 1959, becoming the 49th state. Although there are no officially defined borders to demarcate the regions, it's widely accepted that there are five main regions in the state. They are commonly known as Far North, Interior, South Central, Southwest, and Southeast. There's a common misconception that the entire state is permanently freezing cold and covered in snow, but there is some diversity. Climatic conditions in the far north part of the state are Arctic, while the southeast is oceanic. The state's interior has recorded both the highest and lowest temperatures statewide, a high of 100 degrees Fahrenheit and a low of negative 80 Fahrenheit. And if you want to hear that in Celsius, that's 38 degrees Celsius and negative 62 Celsius. Water resources are abundant in Alaska with heavy snowfall and an abundance of lakes and rivers, so fresh water is easy to come by. There's an incredible array of wildlife that includes moose, doll sheep, caribou, bears, mountain goats, and salmon, just to name a few. As for plant life, there's plenty of it, both wild and cultivated. It may surprise some to learn that the state's long summer days have led to the production of some un unusually oversized produce. Examples harvested in recent years include a 35 pound broccoli, that's 16 kilos, a 65 pound cantaloupe, that's 29 kilos, and a cabbage coming in at 138 pounds. That's 63 kilos. There's a certain quirkiness to Alaska, and there are many truly unique things about the state. Dog mushing is the official state sport, and there's a museum dedicated to hammers. And please, if you're visiting the last frontier, don't give any beer to the moose. It's against the law. Fascinating state facts aside, we're here to talk about monsters. And when it comes to Alaskan monster sightings, there are plenty. Water monsters abound in the state. With an abundance of fresh water and the seas around it, there's plenty of room for strange creatures to dwell. From the well-known monster in Lake Iliamna, sightings of weird serpent-like things in the ocean, to First Nations legends of water creatures, Alaska has quite the variety of aquatic unknowns. But it's not just Alaskan waters that hold mysteries. Giant birds have been sighted soaring over the state skies. If the legendary Thunderbirds are indeed living in North America, the northernmost state may be their hiding place. Needless to say, Alaska has an abundance of Sasquatch reports. The hairy giant has been spotted digging in the sand on beaches, swimming in the frigid waters, darting away into the thick forests, and navigating deep snowbanks with no trouble. Sasquatch has a rich history in Alaska. Native Alaskan tribes have long-standing traditions involving the cryptid Bigfoot. Called by a variety of names that often translate to terms such as Big Man or Hairy Man, these beasts have been in the region as long as tribal memory. It makes sense, really. Despite modern developments, Alaska is still a frontier in many respects, and there's an abundance of unexplored territory. America's largest national forest is in the state. The Tongass National Forest was established in 1907 and covers an amazing 16.7 million acres that's 6.8 million hectares, more than three times the size 
of the next largest national forest, which is also in Alaska. In short, there are tens of thousands of acres of wilderness, a perfect hiding place for large, undiscovered creatures to live. There are other legends, too, legends of creatures from the past that some say still survive in the wilds of Alaska. Do mammoths still roam the tundra? Is there a dinosaur near Kodiak Island? And does a massive prehistoric bear still prowl the snow-covered landscape? These and similar questions have lingered for years. Are the tales just fanciful stories? Or have ancient creatures really managed to hold on in small enclaves of the state's remote regions? There's a certain mystery to Alaska, an otherworldly quality that's difficult to explain. The region has an intangible, something that affects people on a deep level. Some, of course, have no connection, no feeling other than the stark cold, while others journey to the rugged place only to fall in love with its uniqueness. Some simply enjoy the trip, while others remain entranced by something felt but undefined. Perhaps Bigfoot and the other creatures feel it too, or perhaps they just enjoy the solitude of the cold Alaskan climes. I hope you enjoy this exploration into some of the rich cryptid history of Alaska. Grab your parka and join me on the trek as we delve into the monsters of the last frontier. So that's the introduction by David Weatherly. Not too shabby, huh? Not too shabby. I think he might have a future in writing. What do you think? Great stuff. That makes you want to hop on an airplane and just go there right now, doesn't it? Get away from it all. <laughs> uh, this book, by the way, is full of great pictures and illustrations, and I'm talking about crazy illustrations. Before I get to the, to the Otter Man, I just want to go real quick over the table of contents so that you understand sort of the magnitude of all the things that are in here. Um, you have part one, which is Alaska's Weird Waters, a watery land, the Iliamnus Lake Monster, the Kodiak Dinosaur, Sea Serpents and Other Aquatic Oddities, Globsters, that sounds like a good one, doesn't it? Globsters. Part two is Sasquatch, Otter Men, and Other Hairy Bipeds. So let's see, that breaks down into Sasquatch in Alaska, Alaskan First Nations and Hairy Men, Bethel Encounters, Wild Men and Vicious Bushmen, Decades of Sightings, The Lake Iliamna Hairy Man, Glacial Demon, The Strange Tale of Harry D. Culp. Yeah, think about that. Isn't that a great name for a title? The Strange Tale of Harry D. Culp. Makes you wonder, well, who the heck is Harry D. Culp and what happened to him? The Mystery of Port Chatham, Land of the Otter Men, uh, part three is strange survivors, lost species, and other legends. And that breaks down into thunderbirds, living mammoths, a land of bears, out of place big cats, canine legends, stellar's amazing animals. And, and I, I want to point out something here before I continue reading this. Like I say, I've never been to Alaska. And there are a lot of really strange words that I'm going to come across. A lot of them are uh, native words. So I don't know if I'm pronouncing this stuff correctly. I know like Lake Iliamna is in there a lot. I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. I didn't look it up, but that's how it appears to be, Lake Iliamna. So forgive me if I'm not pronouncing a lot of these words correctly that are unusual to me. But I could pick any one of those chapters out and read you a fascinating story. But I don't want to read the whole darn book to you because I, David said I could read some of the book. Okay. <laughs> Trust me, you're going to want to buy a copy of this. Maybe after you hear just this part about the land of the Ottermen. 
Okay, are you ready? Here's the story behind Otter Men. When it comes to Alaskan cryptids, one of the most difficult topics to approach is that of the Kushtaka, or Land Otter Men. Some modern researchers believe that tales of the creatures represent another guise of Sasquatch. But leaping to this conclusion simplifies the topic and ignores the First Nations view. In fact, members of native Alaskan tribes strongly disagree with the assessment that a Kushtaka is a Bigfoot, pointing out they have other names for the familiar hairy giant. The Kushtaka is found in both Tlingit and Shmishian lore of southeastern Alaska. The creatures are shapeshifters, able to take human form or the form of an otter. Often they are described as something in between, a bipedal creature half human and half otter. They are reportedly between 6 and 8 feet in height. By the way, that's 1.8 to 2.4 meters. Covered in sleek, black, or dark brown fur. They have human-like hands, but they have talons on their fingers. Their feet are like a human's. Their eyes are large, and by some accounts, the eyes glow. Their mouths are full of needle-like teeth, and they have a long tail. They emit a high-pitched three-part whistle in the pattern of a low, high, low. The creatures have a vast range of supernatural powers. It's said they prey on small children, and purportedly the creatures can even take the full form of other humans or use the voice of a target's friends and relatives to attract their attention. Some consider the term itself taboo and believe that even mentioning the creatures attracts their attention. It's a belief found in other cultures around the world in connection to supernatural entities. In the Middle East, mention of the infamous jinn attracts their unwanted attention. In the American Southwest, the term skinwalker is equally considered a word best not used, lest you draw them to you. Historians and folklorists think the Kushtaka was a type of boogeyman used by the Tlingit mothers to scare their children into following the rules. But casting the creature in the guise of a folkloric or mythical entity doesn't address the serious nature with which the First Nations people view the topic, and the Kushtaka is a very serious matter. It's a topic that weaves through their physical and magical worlds of native culture. The threat is real, and whether it's ultimately a metaphor or the lore of a real physical being almost becomes irrelevant. Early Tales There are many traditional tales related to the Kushtaka, Frederica de Laguna relates an account of someone captured by the creatures. Quote, My father's oldest brother got captured by land otters out at Sitak. He was about four years old. My mother told us, don't go too far in the dark in the night time. He was found two days later, caught between the roots of a tree. When he came to, it was dark, pouring down rain, and he had no clothes on or anything. That Indian doctor's spirit caught him. He got under the trees. The Kukaka dragged him through the roots. They let him drop right between them. He pooped all over himself, and they don't want to handle him. End quote. Some traditional tales relate that even if someone survives being captured by the Kushtaka and escapes, they are never the same and may even go insane. 
from the experience. De Laguna gives us an example of such stories writing about a girl who was taken but returned. Quote, the girl had encountered land otter men in the woods and returned half crazed and raging. She attacked everyone, struck and bit those who tried to hold her and tearing off her clothes ran around naked." End quote. A May 19, 1994 article in the Petersburg Pilot gives us details of a Kushtaka encounter from the 1930s. The incident involved a Tlingit hunter and occurred in the infamous Devil's Country of Thomas Bay. The man was deep in the woods when he heard a strange whistling sound followed by someone calling his name. A weird feeling overtook him, and he realized that a Kushtaka was nearby, attempting to lure him away. Following an old tradition, the man grabbed a branch and bit down hard on the wood. He gathered his strength and quickly left the area. It said the man was so disturbed by his experience that he never hunted again. Why the otter? A curious question arises when studying the lure of the Kushtaka. Out of all of Alaska's animals, why the otter? Why indeed? Normally, at least in modern view, otters are perceived as joyous and happy animals. They're sociable creatures and are both playful and industrious. American naturalist Ernest Thompson Seton wrote of the otter, quote, the joyous, keen, and fearless otter, mild and loving to his own kind, and gentle with his neighbor of the stream, full of play and gladness in his life, full of courage in his stress, ideal in his home, steadfast in death, the noblest little soul that ever went four-footed through the woods." End quote. Yet in the history of some Alaskan First Nations people, otters became the form taken by a strange, otherworldly, and rather dark creature, the Kushtaka. Anthropologist Richard Berezol offers some insight on why the animal may have come to be connected to such a dark aspect. His study of the Tlingit beliefs regarding otters were detailed in his thesis, the Tlingit Land Otter Complex, Coherence in the Social and Shamanic Order. And Berezol writes, quote, the sea otter had a prestigious place in Tlingit society as a bringer of wealth during the period of the fur trade until its near extinction in the 19th century. However, it is the land otter that occupied a prominent place in the belief systems of the Tlingit. The land otter was probably perceived as the most human-like animal in that environment. Particular attributes of the land otters lead to the perception that it has lost, excuse me, that it has the ability to create a symbolic bridge uniting human and animal. It was seen as an ambiguous figure which had the ability, like the Tlingit themselves, to function well both on the land and in the water." End quote. So the concept that Berezal mentions and the human-like behavior of otters likely went a long way in the native belief of the Kushtaka, a belief in the Kushtaka, a creature that represents something truly in between. Now I'm going to read a little bit, just a part of this next section, but it's really interesting. It's called Shamanic Perspectives. Mary Girado Beck mentions the shamanic view of the Kushtaka and reminds us of the shaman's role in Alaskan culture. As a mediator between the world of human beings and the world of supernatural entities, the shaman could travel between the two realms of existence. When possible, the shaman could save those captured by the Kushtaka, bringing them back to the world of normal human existence. Beck reports on the role of the Kushtaka. Quote, Kushtakas were human beings who had been transformed by land otters into creatures similar to themselves. 
but who retained some human qualities. They kidnapped children, frightened women, and caused storms, avalanches, disease, and famine. Kushtakas had been given their dual role by Raven when he bestowed on land otters the gifts of being able to live both on land and under the water as well as powers of illusion and disguise. In addition, he gave them the special mission of saving those lost at sea or in the woods and transforming them into half-human, half-otter beings like themselves." End quote. Beck brings up an important aspect of the Kushtaka and its relationship with the people, namely that the Kushtaka were once humans. Now let's be clear, some accounts claim the Kushtaka kill humans in a terrible manner, namely by using their claws and teeth to rip victims to pieces. But as with many First Nations concepts, it's never so simple. The Kushtaka in a strange way can sometimes be helpful. Those who are lost in the wilderness or those who are drowning may be saved by one of the creatures. There's a catch, of course. Being saved by a Kushtaka means being transformed into one. The transformation allows the human to survive cold temperatures or frigid waters. The exact process of the transformation is shrouded in mystery. It's said that the Kushtaka creates illusions of the person's family and friends to distract them while the change takes place. As the physical transformation begins, the person slowly turns into a hybrid creature more otter than human. While the transformation allows the victim to survive, it's more of a curse than a blessing. They are never the same, never able to return to their homes or their families, and they are forever trapped in the form of a shape-shifting beast. The only hope for a human cult in the process of being transformed into a kushtaka is that someone, a normal human, would recognize them. Such an acknowledgement could pull one back from the brink before it was too late. And that's all I will read. But it goes on from there. Talking more about shamanism, the long tail people, various modern views. Um, you know, it, let me, uh, there are a few things I want to point out here about what I just read to you. For one thing, uh, there is this story about this guy who was in the woods and he realized that Kushtaka was after him. And it says that following an old tradition, the man grabbed a branch and bit down hard on the wood. And uh, then he left the area. So that's, that's obviously some kind of you know, well, David says it's a tradition, a superstition. Uh, but what is that all about, you think? Is that something that anybody can do when they feel like that there is a bad spirit after them? You grab some wood. Is it any wood? Is it special wood and bite down? I don't know. We'll have to find out more about that. Maybe um, maybe I'll do some more research on that and, and we'll dig into it. Uh, and also, you, you know, this is a good example of why that a lot of people think that I just dismiss monsters, and that's not true. I think that all these cryptids, Bigfoot and Mothman and Thunderbirds and Loch Ness Monster and Hellhounds and now Kishtaka, uh, that all these things probably do exist, but they're not normal biological organisms that just remain to be discovered when we get a dead body or somebody shoots one or traps it in a cage. I think that it's they're all sort of interdimensional, you know, like the, the skinwalker concept, that it's more of a, a spiritual shamanic thing. And people who see these things find that impossible to believe because when you see an interdimensional being, when it is in its physical form, it is physical at that point. 
it looks just as physical as you or me or the dog or the cat or the giraffe or the kangaroo or whatever okay for that moment you see something physical so tangible so corporeal that it's impossible for you to imagine that it could be any other way but that's why we can't catch them that they actually do have this ability to transform to transition from one plane to another and uh, so i think that that's one of the great things about the type of work that david does here is that you know he doesn't just look at these things as uh, some undiscovered biological organism you know some people say that like they think bigfoot is just some big gorilla basically you know running around out in the woods and one day we'll get him and i just don't feel that way i think that we have we've explored enough we have enough technology that um you know you, you can never tell what may come from some very very thick part of the wilderness perhaps in alaska or some part of africa but you know you have bigfoot reports in all 50 states every year and um you know if, if the only way we can reconcile those reports uh with um you know the the, the honesty of, of those reports with the, the lack of evidence is to say look we are primarily talking about something that is of more of an apparitional and interdimensional nature but uh now you know possibly a new word did you know that word kushtaka i like it the more i say it the more i like it so uh maybe we need to have like some kushtaka merchandise made right <laughs> david can make some kushtaka keychains and um and t-shirts they would that'd be a hot seller probably get sam sheeran to, to take his mock up and make it look like a friendly kushtaka because so many people they would love to have like a an a cute looking otter there but with this sort of sinister connotation the kushtaka but this book is just full of surprises it's just like all of other um all all the other works by mr david weatherly so congratulations to him on this uh i commend him on having created something like this it's 228 pages 228 pages just chock full of great information like that uh, by the way david's website is eerielights.com e-e-r-i-e-l-i-g-h-t-s eerielights.com so if you want to go there i'm sure that's just a great resource for you to learn about not only this but his other works but you know if you just go to amazon and look up this book monsters of the last frontier by david weatherly let's see here I don't know. Let's 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 take a look and see how much this book cost right now. And by the way, uh, I did not receive this book for free. I didn't ask for a free copy. I got on Amazon and I bought it. Now, David is a good friend of mine, but uh, I am an author, and I realized that if I gave a book away to all my friends, well, I would just be writing a free book at that point. But this one is worth buying. Okay, yeah, Monsters of the Last Frontier, Cryptids and Legends of Alaska by David Weatherly. You can get it in paperback for $19.95. And um, let's see, I'm not sure if it's available on Kindle or not. But, you know, he's, he's David has also um, written these other great books about... Um, regional monsters he has copper state monsters which are cryptids and legends of arizona and then of course he and that's a great one but then of course there is my favorite which is silver state monsters and that one as you can imagine is about nevada here silver state monsters cryptids and legends of nevada um this is a book that we refer to frequently for the creepy vegas ghost and ufo show and if you ever come into town and we're not doing the creepy vegas ghost and ufo show again yet because we're still waiting for um our venues to open up and get to full capacity and 
you know, all this, all that to come back to normal. Um, but if you are ever in Las Vegas and you're lucky enough to get a ticket to see the show, you might be even luckier and uh, David will pop up. And when he's there, we, we pause and we let him stand up and tell some of the stories in the show. So um, he's, I don't know if he's going to go to all 50 states. I, I think I may have heard him say once that if he lives long enough, he might go to all 50 states. But whoo, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work to crank out. Even if you cranked out like two of these a year, you know, I mean, geez. But anyway, thanks to David for letting me read those portions to you. And I hope that you'll check out his website, eerielights.com, and go to Amazon and take a look at this book. As a matter of fact, I think I'm going to buy another copy of this book and send it to my dad for Father's Day coming up soon. I think he'll like that. My dad's never been to Alaska, but he's a... He's a wilderness guy. He'll enjoy this. So anyway, glad I was able to read that to you. And um, one of these days, I'm going to get David on this program. And, well, we're going to talk to him about all of his crazy adventures. He's on a lot of different shows. He was just recently on Coast to Coast AM uh, around the time I was in Colorado, as a matter of fact. So anyway, um, you know, I have quite a schedule this month, so I will do my best to leave podcasts for you whenever I can, but I hope you enjoyed that reading of, well, portions of Monsters of the Last Frontier, Cryptids and Legends of Alaska, and uh, remember now, folks, if you enjoy this podcast, well, do me a favor, uh, forward it to all your friends and loved ones and people you think might also be interested and please tell them to go visit my website joshuapwarren.com there is no period after the p when you go to joshuapwarren.com the first thing you should do is sign up for my free e-newsletter takes you about two seconds it's free and spam free you get everything sent directly from me right from my fingers on the keyboard typos and all and um Click around, look at the videos, look at the pictures, look at the crazy data that I'm always putting on there. Go to the curiosity shop, find things there you will not find anywhere else in the world, I promise you. And go click the link to this podcast. It's called Joshua P. Warren Daily. It is always short, it's always free, commercial free, uncensored, independent, let me repeat that, independent, very proud of that. You can subscribe through various means, different platforms while you're there, or just follow me on Twitter, at Joshua P. Warren, at Joshua P. Warren, and I will usually tweet when a new one is available. So, thank you for listening. Thank you for your interest and support. Thank you for staying curious, and I will talk to you again soon.